All right, thank you all so much for joining us today. Joining our webinar talking about getting the lead out of drinking water with a focus on Hamilton for today. My name is April Wepler and I am the engagement coordinator for the Healthy Great Lakes program at the Canadian Environmental Law Association or CELA. And I'd like to start off today with a brief land acknowledgement. So I'm calling in today from Guelph from the banks of the Aramosa River, which is situated on the ancestral homelands of the Anishinaabek peoples, specifically the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the Six Nations of the Grand Watershed. So a little bit of housekeeping right off the bat, um, we're using Zoom meeting for our platform today. So you do have power over your um, mic and over your camera. Since there aren't that many of us on the line today, you're welcome to keep your camera on if you'd like to. Um, I'll ask you all to stay muted until we get to the Q&A portion. We are going to record the session. We weren't going to because we have a great recording from the Thunder Bay session that we did a little while ago, but I think we will record um, today just in case some folks weren't able to join us and, and want to be able to hear the conversation. There is also a great recording on our website. Um, you're gonna hear a short presentation from Anaria Muchai in a few minutes. Um, there's a bit of an intro to LED and she did a more fulsome version of the same presentation um, a few weeks back and that longer fuller version is on our website. So I'll tell you first a little bit about CELA for those who might not know us. So the Canadian Environmental Law Association or CELA is a specialty legal aid clinic within the Ontario wide network of clinics funded by Legal Aid Ontario. And we work to protect human health and our environment by seeking justice for those harmed by pollution and by working to change those policies to prevent such problems in the first place. As a legal aid clinic, our top priority is to represent low income individuals and communities and to speak up for those with less influence and who receive less of a say in decision making. We are co hosting our webinar today with Environment Hamilton, and I'm pleased to be joined by Linda Lukasik. Linda is a co founder and the executive director of Environment Hamilton. She holds a PhD in planning from the University of Waterloo. Her work in Environment Hamilton focuses on advocating for a climate resilient, inclusive Hamilton. This includes pushing for the city of Hamilton to keep our urban boundary firm in order to protect prime farmland and facilitate building transit friendly, higher density communities within the existing urban area. Linda, would you like to take a few minutes now and tell us a bit about a bit more about Environment Hamilton? Sure, thanks very much, April. And hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us today. For those of you who don't know us, Environment Hamilton is a not-for-profit. Uh, environmental organization in the city. We've been around now for 20 years and we have a mandate to provide Hamiltonians with knowledge and skills to help people to be able to work alongside us to enhance and protect the environment in Hamilton. And a lot of our work over the years has focused on helping to facilitate empowerment in, in more impacted neighborhoods. So I'm really pleased to be part of the session today and, and to be part of this conversation about lead and drinking water. Um, you know, one of those risks that people may not be aware of, um, one of those risks that, you know, sometimes there are barriers to addressing. So, so it's an important conversation and looking forward to being part of it. Thanks very much. Oh, April, you're muted. Oh, thank you, Linda. I haven't done that before. <laughs> It's like that's on the Zoom bingo, right? Somebody talks while they're, while they're muted. So there you go. You can check that square off. Thanks, Linda. Um, tell you a little bit about our agenda today. So uh, I've introduced Linda. I'm going to introduce our other speakers right before we get into our panel. Anari Muchai in a couple of minutes is going to give us um, an overview of uh, the impacts of lead on our health, where lead comes from, a little bit of the legislative framework, um, an introduction to that piece. And then we're going to have a panel discussion uh, that Linda will be moderating for us with a couple of great speakers, so who I'll introduce momentarily. And then we're going to save a nice chunk of time for discussion because we do want to hear from all of you on the call as well. And then we'll finish up just before one o'clock. So at this point, I do want to just run a couple of quick polls so that we can get a better sense of who's on the line. So let me just get to my poll window. Real quick here. Zoom is being a little bit glitchy for me today. We're usually good friends. All right, so here's our first question about sector. So if I could ask you to just uh, 
answer that question should be popped up on your screen hopefully tell us a little bit about where you work or if you are an interested Hamilton resident that's great too okay I'm going to leave that up for just another moment all right so here's some information back for you so most of you um indicating that you're with a non-governmental organization or an NGO. Um, also great to see some academics or students and then a government rep, someone from the legal community, which may be one of our speakers or one of our staff possibly, because <laughs> we have lots of lawyers and paralegals in our crew. Um, and then also someone from the public health sector, which is awesome. All right, the next question we're going to ask is about where you are calling from today. And I can likely predict most of you are going to answer Lake Ontario, maybe some from Lake Erie. I suspect is going to be most of us. And if you're not sure what watershed you're in, that's okay too. All right, we'll give that a couple more seconds. Oh, you're all really quick. Okay, great. Yeah, I was right. <laughs> not surprisingly with the Hamilton focus, almost everyone on the line from Lake Ontario, a couple in Lake Erie and another. All right, our next question that we're going to ask today just get this back is about just your knowledge level this is really helpful um, for our speakers to get a sense of how much you feel like you already know about this topic um, it's a complex one um, so i'm sure lots of us have lots to learn about it even if we have exposure to some parts of this topic oh awesome we have somebody on the line from winnipeg that's fantastic welcome All right, we'll give this another moment and just share this back so you can see. Yeah, not surprisingly, a lot of us feel like we have some level of knowledge around this, um, but still a fair bit to learn. So that's great. We will learn together today. All right, so I believe the next thing I have to do um, is pass the mic over to Anaria. I'm just going to stop screen sharing here so that Anaria can put her slides up. And Anaria Muchai is a law student with SELA, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about um, lead in our drinking water today and just give us all a bit of a grounding in this topic. Um, okay, did that work? Can you see my slides? Yeah, if you just want to expand them to full screen, Anaria, that'd be great. Yes. Okay, perfect. So, um... Okay, so the get the lead out of drinking water. Um, so today we're going to spend a little bit of time. Um, April already talked about CELA, so we're just going to skim over that part. Um, but why is that a problem? Uh, a review of Ontario's approach to lead under the Safe uh, Drinking Water Act, and then highlight some of CELA's recommendations on how to deal with lead. So the purpose of today, uh, it really is an information session um, and a panel discussion on lead in drinking water. So a discussion on the health impacts of lead in our drinking water, um, the key recommendations on what various levels of government um, and utilities need to do to ensure safe drinking water for everyone in Ontario. Uh, and then we're gonna highlight a panel discussion uh, on lead in drinking water uh, in Hamilton. So lead is a naturally occurring element that's found in small amounts in the Earth's uh, crust. Lead can be found in all parts of the environment, whether it be the air, soil, dust, or water. Um, lead can be found in, in water. Lead can be found in water service uh, pipes in homes that were built between uh, built before the mid 1950s, uh, in solder that is used to join pipes together before the 1990s, um, and then leaded brass fixtures such as faucets uh, or valves. And so uh, as these items corrode or break down, lead can then proceed to enter the drinking water. So because lead has no taste, odor, or color, without more publicly available information, the public may not know of this exposure. This is why taking a comprehensive, multifaceted, multi-pronged approach to the issue of lead in water is really the only way to deal uh, with lead in the water. Uh, in order to ensure that all Ontarians, no matter their age, class, or background, will be able to know that they are safe from the detrimental effects of lead when they turn on their pipes. 
So why is lead a problem? problem. Lead can be toxic to both humans uh, and animals, causing severe health effects. Uh, and you see that uh, from this chart, really children are the ones that have the most detrimental uh, health effects. Even at really low levels, uh, lead can result in impairment, leading to reduced IQ and increased likelihood of behavioral symptoms and loss of economic opportunity. So there really are no safe levels of lead. Even at the lowest detectable level of lead exposure, negative health effects occur across all populations. Uh, and our panelist, Matthew Lawson, will speak a little bit more uh, to the health concerns of lead when we get to that portion um, of today. So a review of Ontario's approach to lead in drinking water. So settler law imposed a division of powers under which under the Constitution Act of 1867, which resulted in the inexplicit assignment of water and the environment to either the provincial, provincial or the federal government. So this has resulted in really a fragmented jurisdictional framework by which water is governed in Ontario. Thus water then became the shared jurisdiction between the federal, provincial, provincial territorial and indigenous governments. Now, one of the role of the federal government is to establish guidelines for substances such as lead. Um, and there have been guidelines in Canada for lead in drinking water established by Health Canada since the 1970s. Now the federal government guideline for lead is five parts per billion, while the current provincial guideline is 10 parts per billion. So uh, double the federal amount. Um, Ontario was a North American leader in responding to lead in drinking water almost 14 years ago after elevated levels were found in London and then confirmed in other communities with older infrastructure and uh, other conditions. So Ontario promptly enacted changes to laws and regulations to deal with lead in drinking water. So some of these changes uh, address testing at the tap, corrosion control, uh, testing in schools, flushing and low income filter programs. However, since then, lead service line replacement in some affected municipalities has been slow and poorly tracked. CELA conducted a study in 2018 to 2019 that revealed that many municipalities did not know how many lead service lines remained, and many lacked public information about the extent of the issue. So as many of you may know, lead service lines are a major remaining reservoir of a potential source of lead in drinking water to a large number of Ontarians. So some of the regulatory framework for lead in drinking water, uh, we'll start by discussing the Safe Drinking Water Act. And as April did mention, there is a longer presentation which goes into these uh, acts and regulations into a little bit more detail that's on the CELA website. So the Safe Drinking Water Act, this is a legislation that authorizes Ontario to regulate the quality of drinking water by way of binding stand, uh, standards. This act includes requirements for the treatment and distribution of drinking water in Ontario. And then we have Ontario Regulation 243-07. And this is the schools, private schools uh, and childcare centers regulation. And so this requires facilities to flush their plumbing and sample for lead in drinking water. Uh, the purpose of these requirements is really to help uh, reduce the likelihood of children attending these facilities from being exposed to excessive levels of lead in drinking water. And then we have Ontario Regulation 169-03, and so this is the Ontario Drinking Water Quality Standards. This sets out the lead drinking water standard in Ontario as 10 parts per billion. As, as you may know from before, this was double the federal standard. And then we have Ontario Regulation 170-03, uh, and this is the Drinking Water Systems Regulation. Uh, this establishes testing requirements for contaminants, which include lead, by municipalities. So Section 11 um, of this uh, regulation mandates that the owner of a drinking water system ensures that an annual report is prepared. And section 15.1 is the uh, section of the regulation that deals directly with lead. So what can we conclude from all of this information? 
really we can conclude that there's been a failure to sufficiently protect all residents in Ontario from, ex from exposure uh, to lead in their drinking water. So what are some of CELA's recommendations? So recommendation number one is to lower the Ontario uh, lead standard in drinking water uh, to five micrograms per liter. And so, like I mentioned before, this is the issue because the current provincial lead standard is 10 micrograms per liter while the federal is five. And so how can we do this? Uh, we can do this by amending the regulation I just talked about, 169-03, specifically schedule two, which actually sets out the lead standard. In saying this, uh, CELA supports the Ontario government's move to align with the federal government uh, as the lead standards in Ontario should be strengthened to be made more protective for residents. And we have recommendation number two, which is to improve notice on lead exceedances. And so why is this an issue? Uh, it's because people may not know that they have lead service lines. Um, sorry, my bad. Um, <laughs> looking at two different slides. <laughs> Recommendation number two is to require the mandatory removal of lead service lines. And so why is this an issue? This is an issue because lead service lines are the primary source of lead uh, and the progress to move towards um, lead service lines has been slow and fragmented uh, across the province. So how can we do this? All service lines, uh, CELA recommends that all service lines be identified and mapped by the year 2025 and that a minimum of 75% uh, of lead service line replacement by 2030, and all uh, lead service lines be removed by the year 2035. So replacement of the whole lead service line uh, should occur at the same time, and this should be mandatory. And then the creation of new fed, uh, provincial, funding, provincial funding programs. So uh, low income families should be provided with a grant to cover uh, the cost of lead service line removals, while other homeowner or property owners must have access to general loans or repayment programs. And then we get to the uh, recommendation on improving notice um, on lead exceedances. And so, like I said, this is an issue because people may not know that they have lead service lines. So how can we do this? Um, CLA recommends providing notice to residents by 2025 when all the lead service lines have been identified and mapped. Then providing notice to residents every year after 2025 and when home ownership or tenancy changes. It's also recommended to require notice of a lead test uh, from results that exceed the five micrograms. Uh, to at least one resident of every unit of a multi-unit residence. So here you have a quick overview of the recommend of the summary of recommended approaches. Um, there's a few other here that I didn't touch on, such as improving sampling requirements uh, to capture peak lead levels um, or improve reporting on lead exceedances. Additionally, an important recommendation is to foster the Indigenous federal provincial solutions uh, to address lead and drinking water on reserves. And so how can we uh, achieve this is Ontario should work with on reserve uh, drinking water system operators and the federal government to ensure that all lead service, all potential lead service lines uh, are identified uh, and mapped by 2025 and then 75% removed by 2030 and then all lead service line removal by 2035. So the Ontario government has made a commitment to update their current policies and consulting on further actions to reduce levels of lead in drinking water. And this was highlighted as part of the Made in Ontario Environment Plan. So really the time to act is now. So that concludes the general portion of the webinar. We have some contact information here for Jacqueline Wilson uh, and April Wepler. Wepler. Um, and I'll just go through the next slides, which are a couple of resources that we chose to highlight in this presentation, um, if folks want to do a little bit more research after. So we have the CELA report on lead in drinking water, and there, it's linked uh, here. And then we also have CELA's current submission on lead in drinking water in Ontario, and that's also uh, hyperlinked here. 
you can also visit uh, CELA online and uh, sign up for the CELA bulletin to stay connected to all the wonderful things that CELA does. Now that concludes my presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Anaria. And I'll just reassure everyone in case you weren't able to capture those uh, lengthy URLs quickly enough is we will be doing a follow up email to everyone after the session and we will include all of the links any links that we share through slides or in the chat box we will make sure we capture all of those for you. All right, thanks so much in area. So the next thing that we're going to do is have a bit of a panel conversation. Um, Linda's going to moderate for us, but I'll just quickly introduce our three speakers today. So first up, I will introduce Carrie LeClaire. We're so grateful to Carrie for joining us today. Um, Carrie is the Climate Action Community Coordinator for Hamilton's Ward 3 Councillor Narinder Nan. So we appreciate her joining us today. And then Matthew Lawson. Um, Matt Lawson is a certified public health inspector who has worked with Hamilton Public Health Service in a diversity of environmental health programs since 2002 and currently manages the Health Hazards and Vector Borne Diseases Program. In 2009, Matt helped manage the North Hamilton Child Blood Lead Prevalence Study, which I think he'll speak to a bit today, which investigated lead levels in children under the age of seven and their associated predictors. Matt has a keen interest in geographic information systems and their utility to support local research and program work within the public health unit. For the past 20 months, he has been redeployed within public health service to support both advanced planning and vaccine inventory management work related to the COVID-19 pandemic response. And he is grateful for the opportunity to discuss environmental lead simply because it's not COVID. So glad we can give you a change of pace today, Matt. And then Jackie, I have to apologize because I work closely with you every day. It didn't occur to me to ask you for a bio. So I will introduce Jackie Wilson as one of CELA's staff lawyers, um, deeply knowledgeable on this topic. And Jackie, did you want to add any bio beyond that? I apologize. No, that's okay. Let's get right, right into it. Okay, thanks. So Linda, Matt, Jackie, Carrie, if you all want to unmute your microphones so that we can hear from you, Linda, I will pass the host microphone over to you. Thanks so much, April, and um, uh, thanks to Aniria for that uh, great background presentation to get us rolling. So I'm gonna get, get right into the questions um, and start with a really fundamental one. Um, and that is, why is it important for us to be talking about lead in drinking water? And I'm going to ask Matt to kick things off in responding to that question. Thank you very much, uh, Linda, for that. Um, it's important to be talking about lead because lead is harmful to health uh, in humans. So lead is not understood to have any beneficial role inside of the human body. It is considered to be a neurotoxin. Um, the most susceptible and sensitive population to the toxicity of lead are infants and children under the age of seven and pregnant women uh, and pregnant individuals who um, are and people are planning to uh, conceive a child as well. Um, the that is because that age group, the most sensitive endpoint in terms of the toxicity with uh, that population, is a lowering of their IQ. Is the main um, health effect that is concerning about lead. Mm -hmm. It can really lead to developmental uh, challenges for an individual and uh, can lower their intelligence. Um, in terms of adults and lead toxicity, there's various uh, outcomes. It depends on if it's a recent exposure, an acute exposure to lead, or whether it's just a, um, a, a cumulative type of impact throughout their lifetime of being exposed to lead. In the long term, lead uh, in the body is stored and ossified in bone. So um, when extreme levels of lead exposure can be uh, happen to an adult, it can result in uh, uh, renal function being impaired, it can lead to tremors. Uh, there's a variety of um, symptoms that are related to that. And <clears throat> I would just like to mention, um, and thank you, uh, April, for that uh, bio um, that was read. The We did a blood lead study, a child uh, blood lead prevalence study in 2009 in the city of Hamilton, which 
um, I was happy to be a part of because I enjoy and appreciate, it's not so much enjoy, it's an integrity part. I like getting data of research from local studies. And so um, a public health practitioner, um, Dr. Tom Kazansky from British Columbia, one time I heard him talk at a conference about environmental health issues and he's a big supporter of he's actually what former director of the national collaborating center on environmental health he's a big supporter of local research if you're not looking at things locally you're really just looking at the literature hoping to find a city that looks like yours and you're trying to find within the literature things that match the population you're speaking to so it was great to be able to actually get some data on how bad is blood lead how blood how bad are the blood lead levels in our population so a more scientific explanation of what our research objective was we were trying to determine the distribution of various blood lead levels and we were also trying to find uh, oh sorry of the population zero age zero to seven years under seven years and we were trying to find, uh, get an estimate of the prevalence of blood lead levels that were above a value that would be considered a threshold of concern medically. So um, we did uh, get over 700 or so children, um, I'm happy to say, in um, 2009 to provide a capillary blood sample to have their blood lead measured. And what we found was the that number of that prevalence rate of individuals who are above a, a threshold of concern is consistent with other similar size North American cities. It's just approximately under 1% of that population of children aged zero to seven that had blood lead levels that are above Health Canada's guidance value of being of concern. One thing that's interesting about this issue though in Hamilton is that you know, Canada has a blood lead level value of um, when you're comparing it to the American value, uh, we'll use their terms, it's 10 micrograms per deciliter um, threshold. And in the United States, they've lowered their lead threshold of concern to five micrograms per deciliter, but Canada it still remains 10. So if you were to take our results in the study and apply that five per microgram per deciliter, you'd be approaching maybe a 15% of the population that is um, being exposed to too much lead. So this long, long answer, sorry, Linda, uh, is really saying that within this population, um, lead is still around. It, and it's something that has, um, we've come to the, the conclusion you can live without lead. We just have to put more effort into doing it. Like in terms of our discussion here today, specifically with a focus on lead in drinking water, it is preventable to, you know, not have lead water lines and to remove them. So it's something that can be done to, to help reduce that risk. Thank you, Matt, for that response. And I think really important that we have a sense of some of the research and data that's been gathered in Hamilton. I, I want to quickly ask whether Carrie or Jackie wanted to respond to that question at all before we move on to the next one. If you want, if you, either of you would like to add anything to, to that. Thanks, Linda. Um, I did have something to add to Matt's response. And it, it really does um, come off of what he said, which is that the science has really evolved about what um, lead does to young children and everyone. And the science now is that there is no safe level of lead. And so it's important when we're talking about changing standards and lowering standards, that that's part of the puzzle and it's important. And when Health Canada looked at changing their lead in drinking water guideline from 10 micrograms per liter to five micrograms per liter, that had a significant impact on blood lead levels in children. So that's important and we support it and we want to see that happen in Ontario too, but that isn't the whole story. And the other piece I wanted to highlight is that it's low income and vulnerable children in particular, that are most at risk. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that when you look at the cumulative, um, cumulative impacts of environmental health exposures, the same level of lead um, that a low-income person is exposed to may have a more detrimental impact because of other exposures that they have as well. For instance, um, from air pollution, 
from mold in old housing, from other, um, from living your industry, that type of thing. So the same level can have a, a worse impact on a low income vulnerable person. And also low income people are more likely to live in old homes with lead service lines. And they're more likely to be tenants and not have control over replacing the lead service lines. Great, thank you for that. Carrie, did you want to add at all or? Sure, I think, you know, I'm here to bring you sort of a, a Ward 3 snapshot perspective. Um, Ward 3 is a community, a lower city community um, of about 40,000 people uh, that includes much of the industrial sector. And I think the reason why it's important to talk about it is because there is not widespread awareness. Um, going back to the, some of the points that, that uh, Matt made and, and even in area slides, I think there seems like there's a great deal of data and research out there, but uh, I think what needs to be done is this information has to be broken down so that people can really um, take this information in at a really grassroots level. Uh, I think that the city has made efforts in some of the information packages and flyers that it sends out uh, to homeowners. Um, I think there's been some good efforts at public education, but I think it needs to be really broken down in a way that people are very, very, very clear on what their risks of exposures are and, and what they can do about it. Great, thank, thank you for that, Carrie. Okay, so we're gonna shift on to the next question and that is, what is the status of lead in drinking water in Hamilton? Is it a problem? And Jackie, did you wanna get things started on that question? Yes, thank you. So the first piece of data that we looked at were the 2020 numbers uh, for Hamilton. And based on the report to the uh, drinking water inspector in Ontario, there were two exceedances out of five samples taken for non-residential properties and four exceedances out of 50 for residential properties in Hamilton. And recall again that that is of the 10 micrograms per liter standard. And we would like to see that standard lowered. So presumably there would be more exceedances if that standard was lowered. What's interesting about those numbers is that corrosion control was brought in in Hamilton, which means that a chemical has been added to on, uh, Hamilton's drinking water, which is an interim measure that would lower those levels. And so these exceedances we're seeing is even after that corrosion control step has been taken. And the other piece I wanted to highlight is that um, there are also schools and daycares with lead exceedances. So the data that I have is a bit old and I would certainly like to update it, but um, one thing to keep in mind with schools is that it's not actually likely lead service lines that are causing lead exceedances at, at schools because they're usually bigger buildings and lead service lines don't uh, tend to be able to serve uh, bigger buildings. So it's usually related to uh, the lead solder and fixtures that Aniria was mentioning in her presentation. Um, in 2016, anyway, there were eight Hamilton schools and daycares found to have too much lead in their drinking water. I'll highlight just a few to give you a sense of the numbers we're talking about. At the Creative Me Preschool, um, there was a standing drinking water uh, sample taken. And on October 31st, 2016, and it came back with 30.3 parts per billion, which is about three times the current standard and six times the standard that we're looking for. Uh, at Jackson Jill's Cooperative Preschool on October 17, 2016, the standing drinking water sample was uh, 23 parts per billion. So a little lower, but quite a bit above uh, uh, the current standard and the standard we'd like to see. And one more school to just highlight, today's Family Early Learning and Child Care Delta Adventure Camp. Um, there was an exceedance for both the standing drinking water sample and the flush drinking water sample. In October 2016, the standing drinking water sample was 14.9 parts per billion, and the flush drinking water sample was 13.9 parts per billion. So we're still looking at a, a problem here in Hamilton, for sure. Thank you for that. Again, Carrie and Matthew, did you want to add anything to in responding to that question? Um, if I would, I'll just point out uh, some recent information uh, from a colleague at Hamilton Water uh, provided estimates that there's still approximately uh, 20,000 lead service lines that exist within the city of Hamilton. So <clears throat> just just rounding out the, uh, the information that Jacqueline had provided, um, like what is the status? The status to me in terms of this question means there's still infrastructure that exists within the ground that is, you know, uh, contributing risk to uh, 
lead exposure to the population. So um, that same report uh, does talk about a five and 10 year plan uh, that was recently provided to the Public Works Committee on you know, some cost estimates for if you want to go accelerate this timeline, here's what the cost will be, and here's what a 10 year plan is in a five year. So, um, you know, they, they thankfully they do have some planning and numbers, and there is a discussion about it right now with our city council in Hamilton. But um, it's just that it does still exist within the ground, the risk is there, and uh, there are steps to take. But with any kind of intervention or public health intervention, you're looking to go very far upstream and just make any kind of choice the healthy choice rather than um, you know, the option of say a point of use filter, which is still a valid option for an individual in their home to put a lead filter on their tap, but it'd be better to just get rid of the lead lines that distribute the water that would take care of the problem. Thanks for that, Matthew, and for making us aware that this piece is, is coming in Hamilton. We'll all have to watch for that report to Council for sure. Carrie, did you want to add anything to in responding to that question? Yeah, I guess just to add that in addition to considering uh, where lead lines still exist, uh, I think it's really important to always be having the conversation about the barriers uh, that folks would experience to taking part in lead, uh, lead service line replacement. Um, that conversation, I think, has to go in tandem uh, with any other conversation about uh, the existence and however accelerated the city's response to the problem could be. Great, thank you for that. And actually, this flows very nicely into the next question, which I'm going to get you to start with the response to, and that is, um, where in a community is lead typically a problem, and where in Hamilton? So, um, which which neighborhoods? And Carrie, did you want to start with responding to that question? Sure. Um, this is an interesting question for us. So when we were invited to take part in this webinar uh, through Councillor Nan's social media channels and through one of our re uh, newsletters, uh, we put the word out that this was uh, um, a webinar we were gonna take part in and we were sort of surveying uh, the community to say, is this something that you're aware of in, in your homes and you're in, in your community? Um, and we had very little response. So we went back and tracked all of the emails uh, that our office has received since Councilman Ann uh, took office uh, in 2018. And by and large, what we're hearing from residents uh, is that where they are aware that they need a lead service line replacement, it's sort of dotted all over the community. Um, I'm certainly not seeing a pattern. Uh, and I go back to one of the slides that was presented earlier that it would be amazing to see mapping of exactly uh, where in our communities uh, the lead service lines are, are an issue. So I wouldn't say that we're seeing a, a pattern, but I do want to just mention uh, to the point that Jackie just made about the schools, one of the things in preparing to join all of you today, I did was reach out to our local uh, HWDSB school trustee for Ward 3 um, and asked her what she knew about lead uh, in schools. and. If you'll excuse me for one moment, I'm just, I want to quote directly from the information that was shared back to me. Um, I found this really interesting. Uh, I will quote them. All of our schools have their water tested uh, and each day they flush the systems by turning on the taps in the morning. This effectively reduces any lead in the water to close to zero. Um, I didn't receive any specific information about uh, Ward 3 schools, for example, but I thought it was interesting to share with you that uh, in the cases where lead is present in our schools, um, in this ward and others, um, I thought it was interesting the, the language that was used uh, about uh, flushing the lines in the water just by running the taps uh, would bring the, the existence of lead to close to zero. And I, I don't think that that lines up with what I've heard from uh, information that Sila has shared. So um, I just thought I'd share that little bit of information. Great, Thank, thanks, Carrie. And thanks for giving us more of a sense of, of what you're hearing in Ward 3. I think that's really important for our conversation here today. Matthew and Jackie, do either of you want to um, address that question? Uh, I have a comment. Um, sorry, Jackie, if you'll allow me to go, if you have anything to say. But it's just, I would like to uh, pick up on Carrie's comment about, you know, an, a, a visible pattern, like, is there a visible pattern 
of where the lead lines exist and it looks it's getting harder to identify a pattern i expect that at some point potentially maybe 20 years ago it might have been easier but part of the problem to my understanding would be um, certain lead lines when they um, are replaced whenever the public works department at least from the public side are if they're planning to do a major road reconstruction or if they're planning to do any type of infrastructure um, work related to roadways they often decide to do the water main um, maintenance if it's coming up on a schedule in conjunction just to be hey we're opening up the road let's just do it once we don't want to do it twice for two different projects so sometimes it gets replaced over time and for our study i can tell you that uh, one of the gis applications that we use is we got data layers for infrastructure in what decade was the most recent work and there was some patterns that you could see like you know expected patterns you look at very old neighborhoods in hamilton you would see expectedly very old water main lines this it's never static so this information changes on a, a daily basis literally they're putting in new things all over the city so to that end um it would be great to, I think, to Carrie's point about looking at where lead lines are. People would like to know where where it is. Wouldn't it be awesome if you could go on to the city's website and and do one of those self serve mapping exercises where you're able to turn on a layer of, hey, show me lead lines that have been replaced within, you know, I don't know, five year blocks, something like that. But it would give at least the user some type of information that they can see, oh, they're recently, you know, within the last five or 10 years, there has been some work done here or not. Um, I'd like to think that we're gonna get there one day. I think we will, but it's, um, it's, it's part of that, where do you prioritize this issue? And in, in the speed of all of the other priorities and agenda items that you have as an organization. So um, I'm only speaking as a representative here within public health services. So our public works department though, um, we do have colleagues there that we like to keep in touch with and that we like to remind them that this is a public health issue that still needs attention and focus. Yeah, thank you for that, Matthew. And, and both, both you and Carrie with your comments are underscoring the importance of monitoring and tracking over time where the changes have happened and where we still have issues for sure. Um, Jackie, I don't know if you want to add anything quickly. I'm going to try to move us now into talking about um, some of the some of the solutions. But if, if you'd like I'll to add, add two anything. points very quickly, but I do sure. want to make sure we have some time for questions. So yeah. um, one thing I want to point out is that there's been a lot of work about um, identifying in what communities and where lead service lines are still a problem in the United States. And there's a really interesting report by the United States Government Accountability Office that looked at uh, quite a few different cities and where lead service lines were. And they found that equity considerations like poverty rates um, were an indicator of where lead service lines were. And that was on top of a screening for housing age, which of course is um, the main sort of infrastructure indicator of where uh, those would be. So I thought that was very interesting. Um, and I just wanted to respond to the flushing point as well, just um, uh, to provide some more information. So flushing is actually required um, of schools and daycares under a regulation under the Safe Drinking Water Act, which is a good thing. And it does lower levels and should be continued. It's not a permanent solution. And just to give one example, one of those schools that I highlighted, uh, the Today's Family er uh, Early Learning and Child Care Delta Adventure Camp Center in Hamilton. When I was talking about the standing drinking water uh, level versus the flush drinking water level, that's what that's getting at. So um, the standing drinking water sample at that particular institution at that school was 14.9 uh, parts per billion and the flush drinking water sample was 13.9 parts per billion. Now that's just one place. It did lower the level. It didn't bring it down to zero. And um, you know, that's, that's just one place. That's just the, the data that, that I have in front of me. Um, uh, but I would say that we need to look a little, a little further just to see what the levels are in Hamilton schools. Great, thanks for that response and for confirming that flushing does not equal zero. <laughs> I think that's important for, for people to be aware of that. So we wanna shift now to talking about programs that are available to residents 
who are concerned about the possibility of lead in their drinking water, um, and, and both for testing, but also for uh, remediation, for, for actually addressing the problem. So I know Aniria has some, a slide she was going to put up that we can look at while we have this conversation. And, um, and I don't know if Aniria, you're going to kick off comments or um, whether others on the panel are, are ready to do that at this point, just in terms of programs and testing and remediation opportunities. Yeah, so I'll jump in. Um, thanks, Neria, for Thank this you. slide, because I saw as well um, a bunch of questions about this, which is really important in the chat. So I hope this answers at least some of them. Um, get your water tested if you think that this is an issue, so you know if you're dealing with the problem. So there's a phone number up on the screen. Um, call them, get a free test, um, uh, and that's the first step to take. So I would really highly recommend that if you're concerned. There are funding assistance programs in Hamilton. This is a good thing. Across the province, um, it's a, a bit haphazard and uh, uh, unequal across the province whether there are funding assistance programs at all about replacement. What's available in Hamilton uh, is a $2,500 interest-bearing loan uh, for most people. So you would get the loan and then you would uh, repay it on your water bill over uh, a 10-year maximum repayment period. And uh, from what I could tell, the current interest rate was 2.89%. So um, that's an option for some people and, and an assistance. In terms of low income people, and the qualifier, I should say, for low income people is either uh, that you have qualified for the LEAP program, which is a low income energy support program, uh, an emergency funding program, or the OESP, which is an on bill uh, ongoing support program. But if you are eligible for those, you're also eligible for a no interest loan to help you replace your uh, lead service line. Again, this is a help. Um, in our view, a loan is still um, problematic for low income people because you still have to have um, you know, some capital and you're, you're adding to your monthly expenses and you may not be able to do that. And we'd really recommend grants for low income people um, you know, to take uh, into consideration the actual circumstances of low income people dealing with like very, very tight uh, finances. Um, and the other thing is the filters. So um, yes, filters can certainly help. You need to make sure that they're NSF 53 approved. That's the uh, certification that looks at lead. You can get pitcher filters um, or you can uh, get, get filters that go directly kind of on your uh, uh, water at home. Great, thank you for that, Jackie. Um, Matthew and Carrie, uh, any additions in terms of programs and testing and remediation? Um, I have one point I could add, uh, thank mm -hmm. you, Linda, is just about the lead loan program um, in reaching out to colleagues in Hamilton Water about this program and the type of uptake that it has. Uh, they did provide me numbers from a five-year timeline. Um, from 2017, there was 191 applicants for that program. 2018, it was up to 312. 2019, 262. 2020, 223. And year to date so far in 2021, 98 applications for the lead loan program have been received. Just wanted to contribute that. And, uh, but I think it was a, um, uh, Jacqueline did a very good job in an area in her presentation of explaining those foundation uh, uh, solutions to reducing lead and avoiding the exposure to lead through drinking water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Carrie, any last additions you want to make before we shift into opening it up to Q&A? Sure, I'll just add some of the feedback we've heard from Ward 3 residents um, is a little bit about mixed messaging uh, between the city conveying the urgency uh, of dealing with a, a lead pipe replacement and also the very slow pace of work that the city sometimes provides on their end. Uh, we've also heard from many, 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 many residents. This would be the, the sort of biggest line of communication we get from residents about lead line replacement um, is about property damage uh, that is a result of the work that's done. Uh, damage to their property, uh, usually lawns and walkways, uh, to sidewalks and adjacent roadways, sometimes to their neighbor's properties and also the slow pace of response from the city in terms of dealing with that. Um, so that has a couple of residents that reached out to us 
sort of mentioned that that might be a deterrent to other people uh, to get this work done. Uh, if you see kind of a giant mess on your neighbor's front lawn and, and you know it's coming from a lead line replacement, that might make you uh, less inclined to want to do it yourself. Um, the other thing that had been mentioned to us was that some of the city's messaging, while I think it has improved in terms of clarity, um, I think based on what I see as the 2020, uh, at least the 2020 flyers and, and brochures that were going out to residents, um, it goes back to this mixed, mes mixed messaging issue where residents said to us, um, on the one hand, we feel like we're being told no exposure to lead is safe. And so the responsibility is in your hands to do something about it. But if you can't afford it, uh, there are no currently no grants available to you. So you're on your own. Uh, but also it's okay to drink bottled water, but also uh, the city is moving towards a ban on single use plastics. So we don't want you to drink bottled water, but also that might be your only option. Uh, and we can only at this time offer a loan to help you cover the costs uh, if that's beyond your, your capacity. So uh, I think there's some, some work that could be done from the city's point of view in terms of refining its response to residents. And as is always the case, pushing for that equity perspective to look at those who are the most vulnerable, uh, those who have the lowest incomes and the least capacity to address this problem on their own. Um, and one more thing I'll add, because I forgot to mention when we were talking about where uh, this problem is occurring, and I believe it was addressed uh, in an area of slides, is uh, where residents are being communicated with about lead in their drinking water, those are homeowners. So for the large number of folks that we would have certainly living in Ward 3 and beyond, Folks that are living in rental properties, um, very vulnerable folks who may be living in, for instance, residential care facilities, they would have no control, they would have no awareness necessarily of lead in the water that they're drinking, nor any control to do anything about it. Um, and uh, I'm not aware of how the city is uh, communicating with folks in those circumstances to make sure that uh, they know what they can do to, uh, to improve the situation. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much for that. Thank you to all three of our panelists for all of the details that you've shared, just, you know, bringing all these insights out into the open, I think is really important. I'm going to, I'm going to um, ask April whether there are any questions that have been posed in the chat that you wanted to share with our panelists. Sure. Thanks, Linda. Uh, well, it's actually quite lovely what's happening in the chat because lots of people are asking questions and um, Teresa McClanahan, who is the executive director at SELA, is also on the call and she has been weighing in with some really great information. So I know we're, um, you know, running a few minutes behind where we thought we would for the Q&A, but thankfully we've got lots of great responses in here. Um, I am going to just read one that I think um, it's a particular individual case and I won't read your name. I do want to protect privacy since we're recording and it did get answered, but I suspect it's a question many have run up against. So let me just find that one. Um, it was someone who said that they had asked a question. That's it. I have a lead service pipe in my home, but when I asked a city representative when my neighbor's lead pipe was getting replaced, if we were to be concerned, they said a solution has been poured into the pipe so that your drinking water will not be affected. The take home test kits that show that there's lead in your water could be due to the fact that there are traces of lead in your faucet, for example. Is that true? Could products such as faucet such as a faucet affect these at-home tests? Is the chemical solution that the city has used as an interim measure enough protection? So there was a response sort of shared in the chat, but I think that's something a lot of people have that question. And it may be a two part, it may be, you know, when your neighbor's lead service pipe is being replaced, do you need to be concerned about impacts? But overall, you know, when you're aware that there's a lead service pipe in your neighborhood, do you need to be concerned about what's in your home? Is the solution the city's using sufficient to address that? Um, so I wonder if any of the panelists just want to weigh in so that everybody on the call hears that answer. I can provide, uh, in terms of my awareness and my understanding, yes, absolutely. Uh, fixtures within your own home can contain lead and can contribute to that. Coming through, um, uh, I think Anaria and Jacqueline was talking about it earlier, mentioned it, soldering and certain components uh, between brass fixtures, uh, lead will be there. So it could be contributing to it. But again, in terms of the overall reduction, um, the contribution of water mains being led and the water delivery lines, service lines, mm -hmm. uh, they're a well-established contributor to the problem. And so um, kind of the way that the representative from the city saying that we pour a solution in the line and don't worry about the line now, that's probably a little overreaching. Uh, 
um, working in science, you never say absolutely yes or absolutely no. It never goes to zero and it never goes anywhere else. But it's, um, it, uh, yeah, I'll stop talking. The fixture, yes, uh, definitely can contribute. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks, Matt. Um, all right, I am conscious, Linda, of time that we're at two minutes to one. So while I'd love to spend time going through more of these questions, I'm hoping that people are reading through the questions and the answers in the chat. Um, we can also probably do a bit of a summary of some of these points in our follow-up email, um, if that would be helpful to people. So at this point, um, I'd like to pass the mic over to Jackie for some closing remarks about this uh, topic. Yeah, thank you so much. And thanks for everyone for joining today and the interesting questions in the chat and um, all, of, uh, all of the contributions. I want to finish with a couple of Sila's overarching recommendations about where we want to go from here to get this uh, issue dealt with. And they have been dealt with a little bit in Miria's presentation, but I think it's important. Um, lead service lines um, are the main remaining source of lead in drinking water, although um, as Matt just mentioned, and for that particular individual, it may be um, lead faucets and lead solder. So that is certainly also an issue. Um, and we at this point, want to see mandatory requirements in the provincial legislation to have them replaced. Not having those requirements has meant that it's going too slow, it's taking too long, and it is not getting enough um, interest and it's not being given high enough priority. In the submission that we have on our website now, um, we, we gave deadlines. So we said 2025, we need all of them identified and mapped so that we, we know what we're, we're dealing with. What's the data? What's the problem? What's the scope of it? By 2030, we need them 75% uh, replaced. And by uh, 2035, we need them all replaced. With those mandatory deadlines needs to be paired with financial assistance programs funded by the province. So both for municipalities, it's a big, it's, it's a cost. It's an infrastructure cost. And then certainly for low income individuals um, and for, for others. And I did also want to mention that I appreciate Carrie mentioning tenants because that's a big problem, right? Tenants living in, in um, these houses aren't going to have control and having um, mandatory requirements to replace them would get at some of that lack of control. Um, Great. And thanks. So that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Jackie. That's wonderful. Um, okay. I had up on the screen just a couple of resources. Again, we'll share those all out by email. Um, contact information for me is here. Um, our follow up email will come from my email address so that you all have that and are aware that that's coming. So we're at one o'clock, a minute after one o'clock. I want to say a really big thank you um, to Linda and Matt and Carrie for taking time out of your busy schedules to come and talk with us today. I want to thank everybody who joined the webinar today to learn about this. Um, we hope you share this information with your community, with your neighbors, um, with other organizations that you might work with. Um, and yeah, please take a moment to check out Sila's website um, and we will continue working on this important topic and we'll be in touch. Thanks so much. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thanks to Sila for uh, hosting this webinar. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Sila. Thank you, Linda. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>